All right, Luke Acts for Beginners, lesson number 19. Peter preaches to the Gentiles. We'll be covering Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 12, 25. So this is the uh, last uh, lesson of part one of this series on the book of Acts that deals primarily with Peter's ministry in and around Jerusalem. So Peter, you know, uh, a marvelous ministry that he has had. He's been privileged to be the first to preach the full gospel on Pentecost Sunday. And in this section, Luke will describe the events that precede and follow his preaching to the Gentiles for the first time. Uh, so far, the apostles and their disciples have been preaching to Jews and to Gentile converts to Judaism. Philip, for example, uh, when uh, Philip was preaching to the eunuch. Interesting that Philip preaches to a Gentile convert to Judaism, but someone of a different race now, because the eunuch was from, uh, from Ethiopia. We, we, we see the progress to Jews only, to converts to Judaism, and now even to people of different, uh, of different nations. Peter, however, uh, will break through this wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, and he'll be the one to bring the gospel to a Roman soldier, a Gentile, obviously, thus opening the door for Paul and others later on to freely proclaim the good news to all men, regardless of culture or gender or religion or position in society. So let's begin reading that section in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse one. It says, now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So we need to understand, first of all, that the Jews had two classes of converts. You know, when we're talking about proselytes you know, who come, the Gentiles who become Jews, they had two classes of converts. One, a proselytes of the gate. These were converts who were not subject to circumcision and observed only a limited portion of the law, forbidding idolatry, blasphemy, disobedience to judges, uh, murder, fornication, incest, theft, and eating of blood. The eunuch, for example, that Philip baptized, he was one of these, as was Cornelius, probably because he was a Roman soldier and a foreigner. The idea of proselytes of the gate meant that these converts to Judaism could come to the temple but could not enter in. They, they were stopped at the gate. They could not go further into the temple complex. Then you had the proselytes of righteousness. These were Gentiles that became complete Jews, accepting circumcision and subject to the entire law. These could enter and worship at the temple. Although he was a proselyte of the gate, Luke describes Cornelius as a centurion, first of all. A centurion is a Roman officer of more than, not more than, of, but rather a, 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 an officer over about 100 soldiers. Um, Luke describes this uh, centurion in the following way. He says he was a devout man, pious. In other words, the things of God were important to him. That's, that's the idea of piety. That all the things you know, connected to God and the worship of God are important to you. Uh, he was a man that feared God. Uh, he was a proselyte who worshiped the God of the Jews and led his household in that direction. Luke also describes him as one being benevolent. He used his position and wealth to benefit the poor, thus confirming that his faith was sincere. And he was spiritually minded. He wanted a spiritual relationship with God and he pr pursued that relationship through constant prayer. So we see that his prayers are answered as God gives him instructions to bring Peter to his home. I want you to note that the angel who appeared to Cornelius could have preached the gospel to him then and there. But that task 
was given by God to men, not to angels. So that even if it was more complicated to arrange, Cornelius sends for Peter. And so now you know, the scene shifts to Peter and what Peter is doing during this time. So let's keep going in Acts chapter 10. It says, on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open up and an object, a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Um, it says that when Peter arrived at Joppa, and there on our map we see where Joppa is, uh, northwest from uh, Jerusalem, not far from Caesarea, uh, God provides a vision where Peter is commanded to eat food that Jews were not permitted to eat according to Jewish food laws. The Lord had prepared Cornelius with the visit of an angel to give him specified instructions. And now uh, the Lord prepares Peter with a vision that will enable him to carry out God's mission despite the challenges it'll present him as a faithful Jew. I mean, Jewish ceremonial and food laws were given to the Jews by God in order to make a distinction between themselves as God's people and other nations, Gentiles if you wish, who were not God's people. For example, <clears throat> the whole world at that time labored seven days, uh, seven days a week. You know, the, the idea of the weekend, that's a relatively new phenomenon. You know, 150 years ago, there was no such thing as the weekend being promoted by different you know, uh, entertainment venues. There was no weekend, people worked. Well, it was the same way in that time. No such thing as the weekend, people worked seven days a week. But the Jews were different in that they devoted one day, the Sabbath day, to the Lord and rested on that day. Even the slaves in that society uh, uh, had to um, uh, observe the, uh, the Sabbath day. And in this they were different from the nations around them. The other nations uh, ate every kind of food, but Jews were different because what they did or did not eat was guided by their law given to them by God. So once Christ came, the way to be separated from the world was to follow Him and submit to the direction of the Holy Spirit who leads Christians through His word, the New Testament, spoken by Christ and taught by His apostles. We read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So you see the, the problem here? The problem for Peter, as well as the other apostles, was that the practices that they had followed as Jews food laws, Sabbath day observances, and so on and so forth. These were now taken away or fulfilled by Jesus. But they uh, you know, were slow to understand this idea. This included the rules concerning their association with Gentiles. You know, they, they could not enter a Gentile's home or share a meal with a Gentile, nor could they, the Gentiles, enter the, a Jew's home or you know, they couldn't enter the temple, but they couldn't enter a Jew's home either or share a meal with him at the same table. And they had been conditioned this way for centuries. So in the vision of the clean and unclean food and the command to eat, God was teaching Peter two things. First of all, that God had the authority to establish laws, to change laws, or to suspend laws because He was God, the giver of laws. And secondly, he was now amending the law concerning food, declaring that all food was to be considered clean and thus could be eaten freely by Jews. All right. And of course, by Jewish Christians. That's the idea. So understanding this reticence of Peter concerning Gentiles uh, helps us to understand what is going to take place here. So let's keep reading Acts chapter 10. 
It says, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the man and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. Incredible. I mean, Peter, still trying to absorb the meaning of the vision, is told that those sent by Cornelius are at the gate and he should welcome them. And so Peter greets them and after hearing them explain the reason for their journey, he invites them to spend the night with him and Simon's family in that place. Now, Peter may not have understood the full impact of the vision, but nevertheless obeyed God's instructions to invite the Gentiles in despite his discomfort. He had to go against an entire lifetime of conditioning to keep away from the Gentiles, to separate himself from them, certainly not to eat, not to have them in your home, not to have them sleep in your home. All of this he had to you know, go against. So it was, it was, I'm sure, a very difficult moment for Peter. So we keep reading. It says, and on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask for what reason you have sent for me. Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore send to Joppa and invite Simon, who was also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here, present before God, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Luke describes both Cornelius' preparations for Peter's visit. Notice he had no doubt that Peter would come. There's also a marvelous image of these two pious and humble men deferring to one another. Here's Cornelius, the Roman centurion, kneeling in front of this Galilean fisherman in view of his family and friends. And then there's the servant of the Lord refusing this type of homage, declaring the truth that before God, both of them are only men. In other words, both of them are only sinful men. So Peter begins by speaking to the obvious elephant in the room here. What are a group of Jewish men doing, visiting and entering the house of a Gentile? Something uh, that everyone knew was not permitted for a Jew. He doesn't describe his vision, as Cornelius will do, but he demonstrates that he has understood the meaning of the vision that he had and he has obeyed it. So Cornelius explains his own vision and how this has led to Peter's arrival in his home. The stage has now been set for the first instance where the gospel is proclaimed to uh, the Gentiles. And so Peter's lesson assumes the fact that his hearers are all familiar with the facts of the gospel, as were most people who lived in the area and knew of Jesus and his ministry, as well as his death and reports of his resurrection. He also includes the uh, new information given him by God in the vision that the gospel is for everyone, not just for Jews to whom he had been preaching since Pentecost. His main point 
is that he and the apostles are actual witnesses of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So let's kind of jump into his sermon from this point on in chapter 10, verse 39. He says, we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So Peter you know, preaches the gospel, preaches about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that they as apostles who are witnesses of this, of all of this, including the resurrection, are here to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So now we see the response to Peter's preaching in verse 44. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. So I have a question here. Before Peter can finish by encouraging his audience to repent and be baptized because that's, you know, that's where he's going. That's, where, that's how he preached at Pentecost. This is the direction that he's going. Before he gets there, the crowd, uh, not, not the crowd, but the people that are uh, uh, listening to him in Cornelius' home and the, 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 the individuals that he had invited began to speak in tongues. They began to praise God. Luke describes this phenomenon as the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. OK, so now I, I want to stop here in the reading and I want to ask you the question. Think back to our other lessons where we talked about the Holy Spirit and answer this question. What has just happened here? Empowerment by the Holy Spirit or indwelling by the Holy Spirit? The answer, of course, is empowerment. The Holy Spirit empowered these people to speak in tongues. I believe this happened in order to convince those that did not have a vision, like Peter. You know, Peter had the vision, but his companions didn't. I believe that this happened in order to convince those that did not have Peter's vision that God was extending the gospel to the Gentiles, not only the Jews. Now, there were many prophets who said that this was to be so. A powerful, uh, excuse me, there were many prophets who said that the gospel was, were, was to be preached to, to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Um, Micah chapter 4 verse 2 and Zechariah 8, Amos 9, including Jesus himself in Mark 13, 10. So uh, you know, the, the scriptural basis for the fact that the gospel was to be not just for the Jews but for the Gentiles also is well established. The problem was the people with whom Peter was traveling, uh, they needed some convincing of this, of this fact. So we keep reading verses 47, 48. Uh, Peter says, uh, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to stay on for a few days. So now Peter finishes his lesson by directing these new believers to be baptized because if there were any who doubted that the gospel was also for the Gentiles, their questions had been answered by the Holy Spirit himself when he empowered these people to speak in tongues. Peter mentions that they had received the empowerment by the Spirit just as the apostles had received it. In other words, without human intervention. So we know that the uh, empowerment of the Spirit was also transferred by the apostles laying on of hands of the apostles. We, we understand that. We've read that in the past. But when Peter says, you know, can anyone you know, refuse baptism for the ones who have received the Spirit just as we did? Well, they were empowered without any human intervention. Well, here Cornelius and these people, they were empowered 
without any human you know, mediator, if you wish. And he also insists that they be baptized, meaning that they be immersed in water in order to obey the gospel. And so they can also receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. See, they receive the empowerment directly from the Spirit as a witness to the people there that the gospel you know, should be preached to the Gentiles. And then Peter completes the preaching of the gospel by insisting that they also be baptized, uh, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins so that they may receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit according to Acts chapter two, verse 38. This is why I talked about this you know, back in chapter two, because there's always confusion as to what is, what is taking place here. Okay, so God uses the appearance of an angel, a special vision, and the empowering of the Gentiles to direct Peter to open the gospel to non-Jews. We find out that all of this and more would be necessary to convince the early church made up exclusively of Jewish Christians to accept this directive from God. All right, so we, we move ahead now to uh, chapter 11, uh, verses one to uh, 18. Luke here describes Peter's return to the uh, church in Jerusalem and his explanation of the breakthrough for the gospel message now brought to the Gentiles. I mean, you know, he was there, he experienced the vision, he heard Cornelius explain his you know, calling by the angel. He and the other Jews that were with him witnessed the empowering of uh, Cornelius by the Spirit, so they've all had some direct contact. But the brethren in Jerusalem, they've not seen any vision, they've not heard any angel, they've not witnessed any empowerment. So they need some explanation here. So upon his return, he faces a, a skeptical reaction from the Jewish Christians who are concerned that he has associated with and preached to Gentiles. I mean, it's only natural. Can you, I mean, this is a big church here. People are saying, did you hear about Peter? He went to, he went to a centurion's house. He had, he had Gentiles in his house and then he went to a centurion's house and he stayed with them and he even preached the gospel to them. What's going on? So it's interesting to note that Peter the Apostle was still subject to explaining his actions to the church in order to guarantee and prove that what he had done was from God and not his own initiative. Uh, just a small note here, doesn't that, that doesn't sound like Peter is the boss apostle. It doesn't sound like Peter is the, you know, the apostle who's in charge of all the other apostles because he has to go back to the church in Jerusalem and explain himself and give good reasons why he did what he did. Today, of course, leaders and teachers in the congregation are accountable to the church. And the church uses the scriptures in order to judge their teachings and their ministry. Now, Luke doesn't give a whole lot of explanation as to the conversation that, that took place between you know, Peter and the others uh, when, he, you know, when he came back to report to the, to the church. But I, you know, I suggest to you that he probably uh, used the, the scriptures that I mentioned before uh, that, that, that prophesied that the, um, that the gospel was to be uh, 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 proclaimed to all men, not just to, to Jews, along with the witness of what took place in his uh, personal experience, along with the witness of the other brethren, to confirm to the, um, to the church that what Peter had done was according to God's word and according to God's will. All right, so now Luke is going to change his, um, his focus and look at the church in Antioch. And we're going to read about that in Acts chapter 11, um, beginning in verse 20. It says, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them 
all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So here we see God's providential care ordering events in favor of His kingdom on earth, which is the church. So you know, let's see the things, how, they, how, how all of this you know, works itself out. So you have Peter, who's opened the door to the preaching of the gospel to, to, to Gentiles. Then Christians are forced out of Jerusalem you know, with the death of Stephen, the martyrdom of Stephen. Uh, there's a persecution of the church. The apostles, we are told, remain in Jerusalem. That's their base. But many people in the church are scattered throughout the, uh, throughout the nation. And so Christians forced out of Jerusalem begin preaching to people and as they move away from, you know, from Jerusalem and from their own country into the northern territories, they begin to uh, preach the gospel to Gentiles. This news reaches the leaders in Jerusalem who have already given their blessing to the evangelization of the Gentile people. Barnabas, who has proven his faithfulness and generosity to the church, is sent to teach these brethren who have formed or joined the church at Antioch, again, in the northern part of the country. And we remember Barnabas was a Levite, right? So he was able to teach, he knew the law, he knew the scriptures, plus he was a faithful and generous Christian. Luke writes that Barnabas' ministry there was successful and the church grew. So we continue reading. And he left for Tarsus, this is Barnabas by the way, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So growing churches need ministers. So Barnabas finds Saul, since as a Roman citizen, Saul will be effective in teaching these Gentile converts. Now we can understand that the name Christian was coined at Antioch since they had a mixed cultural group. There were Jews and there were Gentiles and they needed a, a concise name that would eliminate any cultural or social or former religious identities from them. And so the term Christian, the term Christian was perfect because under that term all, the, all of these disparate cultures, men, women, former Gentiles, uh, former Jews, uh, Gentiles converted to Judaism who are now converted to Christianity. You know, all of these people could come together under one name and that name was Christians, the name that we hold even to this day. We continue reading. It says, now at this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So a true test of fellowship arises, this time for Gentile Christians. A famine is predicted by one of the prophets from Jerusalem along with a request for assistance. Uh, this was the first example of intercongregational cooperation for the purpose of assistance and, and benevolence. Now the challenge for Antioch was if the Gentile brethren there would send money to their Jewish brothers and sisters who before becoming Christians had despised them, and the challenge for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem was the reverse. Would they receive charity from Gentiles, even Gentiles who had confessed Christ? Of course, the answer is in verse 29, where Luke reports that all who had the ability, both Jew and Gentile, gave. And the two main teachers, Barnabas, and he's named first because he is still discipling Saul at this point, Barnabas and Saul are entrusted with delivering the gift to the church in Jerusalem. So the way that all of this was handled was a testimony that the apostles in Jerusalem and the teachers, Barnabas and Saul, were doing a good job in their teaching and in their preaching ministries. How do we know? Well, we see what's taking place here. You know, faith being expressed through love. Their faith was strong and sincere and it was proven through the love that they showed in helping their brethren. 
Now an ep another episode uh, takes place that Luke is going to describe beginning in chapter 12 and that's uh, Peter's arrest and his subsequent delivery. So we begin reading in Acts 12. Now about that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James the brother of John put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. So Luke chooses to end his narrative of Peter's ministry with his arrest by Herod and miraculous deliverance by the hand of an angel, we read a little further on. Luke also adds more, more early church historical information by including the death of the apostle James. The church in Jerusalem is undergoing severe trials and challenges at this time. For example, um, the challenge brought about by rapid growth. I mean, several thousand people were added to the church in just a couple of years. That, that brings you know, all kinds of uh, you know, procedural problems, technical problems in delivering ministry to, uh, to all of these people all of a sudden. Um, there were demanding benevolent needs. You know, imagine if you have seven deacons and their only job is to supervise food distribution for widows. Uh, and that's daily food distribution. Uh, there was the local famine on the general population that was prophesied by Agabus that we just read about. And of course, the persecution of the church beginning with Stephen's death and the dispersion of many members from, um, from Jerusalem. Now Luke adds that James is killed and Peter is arrested, and this time not by the Jewish religious leaders, but by King Herod. Now this King Herod, uh, he was not Herod Antipas who had questioned Jesus and only, uh, he had only ruled in uh, the northern region of Galilee. This was Herod Agrippa I, a grandson of Herod the Great, who now ruled all of the region and was seated in Jerusalem. He's the one that had Peter arrested uh, to curry favor with the Jewish uh, leaders. And so if we were to continue reading Acts chapter 12, 6 to 19, we don't have time to do that. This is pretty much what is contained there. Luke mentions that despite their many trials and discouragements, the church prayed for Peter's release. Peter's miraculous escape is made possible by an angel and it is described in the kind of detail that could have only been provided by an eyewitness. Luke also adds a humorous account of how a young maid's excitement left Peter standing out in the street knocking on the door of Mary, that is Mary John Mark's mother's house, while she ran in to announce that Peter was at the door. So the church is praying for Peter to you know, be uh, somehow delivered from jail. Peter is released from jail, but by the, the, act, the miraculous act of an angel, he makes his way to uh, John Mark's mother's house. He knocks on the door. The girl, the servant girl, name is Rhoda. She looks and she sees that it's him. She's all excited and she runs in to tell that Peter's at the door, but Peter's still at the door banging, trying to get in. So even a little a humorous note that we, we find. Peter is finally let in and he instructs the brethren to inform James, James the Lord's brother, not the apostle who had been ki killed by Herod. The James uh, is John's brother. You know, James and John, that James is killed. There's another James who's not an apostle who was the Lord's brother who was a leader in the church at that time. So um, uh, Peter instructs the brother to inform James uh, and others of his freedom. And Peter probably went in hiding to avoid Herod's effort at uh, recapturing him. Luke mentions Peter again in chapter 15, where he and others discuss certain issues taking place at the church in Antioch. In Acts chapter 12, verses 20, all the way down to 23, uh, there's an epilogue where Luke adds a few verses describing Herod's death soon after Peter's escape. 
And this death of Herod brought a kind of a lull, if you wish, on the ongoing persecution of the church. And Luke ends the section on Peter's ministry on a positive and hopeful note that we read chapter 12, 24 and 25. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, right? John, John Mark, who is also called Mark. That's in Acts chapter 12, verses 24 and 5. And that ends the section about Peter and Peter's ministry. Next time when we start, we will begin Paul's ministry. But a couple of lessons that kind of come out from the things that we have read today. Lesson one, obey what you know. Obey what you know. We don't always have all the facts. We don't always clearly see God's overall plan or purpose for us when making decisions about obeying His will in a certain matter. In this type of situation, it's wise to obey or to follow the ways or the commands of the Lord that we know and are sure of. After all, we live by faith, we don't live by sight. Sometimes we just have to obey and pray that God will provide us with understanding at some point. I mean, imagine if Peter had been stubborn not understanding God's greater plan. In other words, you know, he has the vision and everything and God is telling them, you know, whatever I make clean is... And Peter said, yeah, yeah, well, I, I know that. I know you can do that, but I, I'm not convinced. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sure about this. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm comfortable in this particular custom. I'm uncomfortable with this particular thing. I, I, don't, I don't think I want to do that. If he, not understanding God's greater plan, refused, to mix with the Gentiles. You know, God would have used another servant and another way to bring the gospel to the Gentiles because God's plans are, not, you know, are never completely uh, stopped. He'll find another way to do what He wants to do. But think of the opportunity and blessings that Peter would have forfeited had he not you know, obeyed what he knew, what was right in front of him. Another lesson. God blesses those who bless. In Acts 10.4, Luke says that Cornelius' prayers and alms giving, you know, giving to the poor, were recognized by God. Now it wasn't that his piety and benevolence saved him. It was that his good works were seen as sincere and in return, God gave him the opportunity to hear the gospel. So there's a lesson here for both the good person who is a Christian and the good person who is not a Christian. For the Christian, he needs to remember that it is not a person's goodness or generosity that saves them. It's the gospel and obedience to it. That's what saves a person. In speaking of personal righteousness, Isaiah said, all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. As Christians, we shouldn't assume that good and kind and generous people are somehow excused from the gospel message. What does Paul say in Romans 3? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody, you, me, my nice old grandma, Queen Elizabeth, the president, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's also a lesson for the good and upstanding person who is not a Christian. You know that good and upstanding person never harmed anyone, always did their best. These people should not depend on their own goodness to save them if they're not Christians. The reward for your good life is not salvation. God's reward to the good person is exposure to the message of the gospel. You can only offer up the sacrifice of Christ through faith expressed in repentance and baptism in exchange for eternal life with God because uh, He won't accept your life no matter how good you believe it to be. You, know, you may be a good person, I may be a good person, try to do my best, but I cannot exchange my quote good life in exchange for salvation because it's not good enough, it's not perfect. I can only offer up the life of Christ through faith expressed in repentance and baptism. That's the, only, that's the only thing I can offer up to God in exchange for my salvation. All right, so 
Uh, we finished with uh, Peter's section in uh, the book of Acts. Uh, next week we're going to start uh, looking at Paul's ministry as Luke describes it, beginning in uh, Acts chapter 13, 1, and we're going to do all the way to ch chapter 15, verse 35. So I encourage you to read ahead and be ready for that. Thank you very much. God bless you.